वेलकम टू लेक्चर 25 ऑफ फाइनेंशियल रिस्क मैनेजमेंट दिस लेक्चर वुड पर्टिकुलरली कवर द बेजल अकॉर्ड वन और व्हाट वी कॉल बेजल वन द कंटेंट्स वुड बी वी विल अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट बेजल वन इज व्हाट आर इट्स रिक्वायरमेंट्स व्हाट इज रिस्क वेटेड एसेट्स आरडब्ल्यूए एंड व्हाट इज कैपिटल एडुकेशन रेशियो हाउ डू वी कैलकुलेट कैपिटल एडुकेशन रेशियो दिस इज व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इन दिस uh lecture so remember basel 1 we 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 saw in previous video that it was issued in 1988 this was the first record uh, the committee that was formed in 1974 they presented their first document in 88 the focus the main focus of this basel accord 1 was on credit risk right the risk that the borrower may not uh, repay the amount this is what credit risk is uh and in this case the borrower is the uh, uh the party who uh, borrowed money from the bank so so a focus is on capital adequacy capital requirement of the financial institutions to minimize the credit risk under basel 1 banks are required to have a capital adequacy ratio of 8% on their rwa so basel 1 wanted Uh, Basel one required that all the banks should maintain a capital adequacy ratio of eight percent. We would just see in a while how do we calculate eight uh, percent of their risk weighted assets. So, uh, by the way, assets for a bank uh, loans for for a bank are their assets. The loans that they have granted are their assets, and the deposits that they receive are their li liabilities because they have to repay the li uh, the the deposits back. so the 8% should be of the risk weighted asset not of the total assets but what we would do is we would assign some risk we would we would calculate the uh, uh, the the amount that is at risk and then we would have to keep 8% uh, 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 capital for that risk amount right so what Basel one did they divided the assets i mean the loan of the bank into five categories uh and uh, the reason was because each category do not have the same amount of risk for example government bonds have lesser risk as compared to corporate bonds so corporate bonds would be a, a given a higher uh, risk weightage whereas uh, government bond would be given a less risk weightage so the come the bank would need to uh, hold more capital for the corporate bond as compared to the government bond so what the basel accord did they created five uh, risk categories so first thing what we need to do is we need to see how what is risk weighted assets how do we calculate the risk weighted asset of a bank and once we are done with this then we would see how do we calculate the uh, car so just to give you an idea if a bank have $1 of a risk uh, risky asset then they must hold according to basel accord they must hold 0.08 dollars that is 8 cents uh, as capital and this is what 8% means of risk weighted asset not of the total asset but of the risk weighted okay so let's understand what risk weighted asset is uh there were uh categories different categories and for example cash gold if the bank hold have cash they have gold they have t bill that is issued by the home country so for example allied bank uh, holds the t bills issued by state bank of pakistan uh insured a residential mortgage for all these types of asset they have zero percent risk so the bank do not need to hold any capital if they have cash they have gold they have tbl of home country or insured risk uh, residential insured mo residential mortgage if uh, they have uh, bonds issued by government agencies so for example we we know there are multiple bonds there are bonds that are issued by different agencies for example wabda bond etc these kind of bonds are not issued by federal government but rather than the agencies of the government or uh, states uh, right 
so for them they need to hold 20 percent uh, of capital for uninsured residential mortgage they need to bank need to hold 50 percent and for corporate bonds t bills issued by less development developed countries the bank would need to hold 100 percent of the amount so for example if a bank have a corporate bond of uh, 1 million that means uh, let's say there is a firm Angro uh, right and Angro issues some bonds they need to install a new plant they issue some bond and that bonds are purchased by a bank A and bank A purchases 1 million worth of bonds from Angro so now Angro would have to pay um, interest to bank A right so now, uh, how much of this 1 million uh, is risky? According to Basel 1, this is a corporate bond. So, 100% uh, amount of this 1 million is a risky asset and banks should hold 8% of this, uh, this risky asset. If it was, uh, uh, if 1 million was in, uh, invested in uninsured residential mortgage, then rather than holding the uh, capital for 1 million because its category is at 50 percent they would have to hold a capital uh, for 50 lakh rupees sorry 5 lakh rupees right half of 1 million 50 percent of the amount is a risky asset this is how it is being given in your book just for a, for, for an idea okay now, what is capital adequacy ratio? We know how to calculate risk weighted asset. We we would also have an example in few uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, a, a capital adequacy ratio is expressed as a percentage of banks' risk weighted uh, credit exposure, or the ratio banks' capital in relation to the risk weighted, also known as CRAR, capital to risk asset ratio. Capital adequacy standard set by bank for international settlement right this this is uh, bank for international settlement uh, they have set these standards it's also called a uh, cook ratio now how do we calculate CER one thing uh, CER uh, we know that we need to have capital to asset ratio right this is simple formula capital to asset ratio should be eight percent this is what we want right let's simplify this so the capital to asset ratio should be eight percent uh, now for example a firm have an asset of one lakh rupees for example they have issued loans of one lakh rupees then how much capital should they hold? We know they should hold 8%. So 8% of 1 lakh rupees would be uh, 8,000. So, so the idea is that if a firm issues a loan of 1 lakh rupees, if they have an asset of 1 lakh rupees, they must hold 8,000 rupees as capital. Right? This is the basic idea. What Basil did, they said, no, you do not need to hold capital for all the assets that you have, the, all the loans that you have issued. Rather, what you need to do is you need to hold 8% for risk-weighted assets. Rather than all assets, you must hold 8% of risk-weighted asset. And then they, they gave us a formula to calculate risk-weighted asset. They told us that let's categorize these assets into different uh, classes. And each class has uh, have an inherent risk and you would have to calculate this risk weighted asset based on that formula. One more thing they did is that instead of telling you that, uh, you know, uh, bank what bank can do, they can hold any kind of capital here. They can hold common stock, they can hold preferred stock, any kind of uh, capital. But what uh, Basil 1 did is that they defined a formula that rather than holding uh, just any capital, they divided the capital into tier 1 capital and tier 2 capital. So, what our formula now is that 
uh, CER is equal to tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital. This capital is divided into tier 1 and tier 2 divided by risk weighted asset. What tier 1 is, it is capital consists of common stock and non-cumulative preferred stock. Okay, so this tier 1 includes common stock and non-cumulative preferred stock. What is non-cumulative preferred stock? Okay, we know preferred stock have a fixed dividend. They receive some fixed dividend. Now, there are two types of preferred stock. One is called cumulative preferred stock and there was called non-cumulative preferred stock. Uh, cumulative preferred stock is when, let's say if uh, this is 2020, if in 2019, the company was not able to pay dividend to preferred stockholder, right? Then if it is a cumulative preferred stock, then the firm would have to pay the previous year's dividend in 2020, right? So they would have to accumulate the dividend and then they have to pay. So for example, if they were not, the dividends were not paid in 2019, in 2020, the firm would have to pay the dividend of 2020 and 20, uh, 2019. In non-cumulative uh, preferred stock, if a firm didn't pay dividend in 2019, then in 2020, what they would do is they would just have to pay the dividend of uh, 2020. So in essence, if you look at tier one, it is less risky capital, right? Uh, common stock, common stock are less risky. Why? That because there is no fixed amount that needs to be paid. There is no fixed uh, interest. If the banks go uh, goes bankrupt, then this is the last amount that uh, the, the common shareholder are lost one to get their money back. <clears throat> and non-cumulative also somewhat. Uh, Preferred stock is somewhat uh, non-riskier as compared to cumulative preferred stock in a sense that if the bank is not able to pay dividend to preferred stockholder, then um, compared to cumulative preferred stock, non-cumulative is less riskier. Coming to second tier, tier 2 uh, is capital, uh, supplementary capital, uh, which includes cumulative preferred stock that we have just seen. Long-term debentures, and remember debentures are just bonds. Subordinated debt, and I would just give you an idea of subordinated debt in a while. So now if you compare tier 1 and tier 2, tier 2 is comparatively more riskier than tier 1 because it have uh, bonds, debentures. Uh, debentures are uh, comparatively riskier than, than common stock. Uh, in a sense uh, that they are long term and subordinated debt, subordinated debt, uh, now what is subordinated debt? When uh, a, a, a subordinated debt is a loan or security that ranks below other ro uh, loans and security when uh, in regard to the claim on the company's asset or earning. Uh, or what we call the junior security or uh, subordinated loan. So in case if the bank goes default, uh, these subordinated debt holders, uh, these lenders would be paid uh, later on compared to the other uh, debtors, right? So, so subordinated debts is the one that have lesser priority. Okay, in addition to uh, defining tier 1 capital and tier 2 capital, uh, this uh, Basel Accord 1 also defined that how much should be tier 1 and tier 2 capital. So they said that at least 50% of the capital should be tier 1. So 50% would be the less risky capital. This is at least amount, it can be higher than this one. And at at least 50% of this tier 1 should be common equity. What this 2% mean is that 8% should be total capital. Out of this 50% should be tier 1. So tier 1 should be how much? 4%. Out of this 4%, 2% uh, should at least be uh, common equity. So what it means is that uh, out of this 100%, 50% should be tier 1 
and uh, 25% out of this 100% or 50% of this tier 1 should be common equity. So, for example, the asset of a bank consists of 100 million of corporate loans, 10 millions of OECD government bonds and 50 million of unsecured residential mortgage, then we need to calculate RWA. So, for RWA to calculate, uh, we have, uh, what assets do we have, right? Uh, first, we have corporate loan, then we have OECD, then we have uh, unsecured residential mortgages. You can go back to previous slide and see what were percentages for uh, these three categories. For corporate bonds, the risk is 100%. For OECD, uh, government bonds, the risk is uh, 0%. For unsecured uh, residential mortgage, the risk is 50%. This is what is assigned by Basel 1. And how much assets do we have in these specific categories? We have 100 million over here, uh, 10 million in OECD government bonds and 50 million. So that means our RWA would be 100% of this 100 million would be again 100, this would be 0 and 50% of 50 million would be 25. So our RWA would be uh, 125. So our uh, assets uh, out of this whole portfolio that uh, that requires some capital to be uh, kept for capital to be assigned for so we need to hold 8% of this 125 million so if you calculate the 8% of this 125 million uh, you would know how much capital uh, we need to hold uh, there is another example in this slide uh, if you look at this one we if, a, if this is the balance sheet of a bank let's just say it holds a cash of 1675 million uh, government bonds of 550 million uh, home loan of 2500 million commercial loan of 4000 municipal bonds of uh, 1000 and other assets of 350 million if we categorize them this cash would come into the zero risk category this bond of government agencies would come into the 20% categories. Remember 20% this is a municipal kind of a bond. Um, bond is issued not by the federal government but by the uh, agency of a government. Home loan would have 50%. Uh, uh, Commercial loans which are corporate loans have a risk of 100%. Other assets have a risk of 100%. Again municipal bond would have a risk of 20%. If we calculate 0% of 1675, we get 0. Total asset is uh, 1075 million. But do we need to assign capital for this one? No, we do not need to assign capital for our total assets, but ra rather uh, for the risk weighted assets. So 20% of this 1550 would be 310, 50% of 2500 would be this one and 100% of 43550 would be this amount. If we add them up, we get the risk weighted asset of 5910, we add all these amount up. So we need to hold 8% for this and the 8% for uh, 5910 uh, amount is 473. So the bank... Uh, this bank, this particular bank need to hold 473 million uh, as capital. So, uh, this is the minimum requirement, right? They can hold uh, more than this one. Okay. So, there are some issues that are attached with uh, Basel 1. And um, to resolve these issues, there was another Basel card introduced uh, in 2001, which was Basel 2. First one, it did not took into account the quality of the counterparty, but just the quantity of the uh, quality of the asset. So, the uh, the categories, the four categories that we had, just divided the asset into different uh, categories, and it didn't uh, categorize the party. For example, uh, if if a, if a loan, if a corporate bond of Microsoft or a corporate bond of a small local company, they both would be assigned a 100% uh, risk element, right, which isn't correct. 
obviously microsoft would have a lesser risk as compared to a small local manufacturer so this is was one of the issue with basel 1 the another issue was that there is limited differentiation differentiation of credit risk there are merely four categories and the risk uh, dividing assets into these four categories um is over uh, simplification of uh, the assets and the last issue was that standardized credit rating uh, system uh, was uh, was there and what this <coughs> meant was that there are companies that have triple a credit rating uh, credit rating if you remember we discussed that there are credit rating agencies such as standard and poor and moody's and they assign credit rating to different uh, uh, corporations their bonds uh, and and countries obviously so if a company that would have a higher credit rating would be uh, would would be assigned the same risk uh, as compared to the company that would have a poor credit rating right they they would also have the same risk so these are some of the disadvantages of basel 1 which was solved in uh, basel 2 and that is what we will discuss in our next lecture